Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 16. This will be part two in Acts 16. I'm going to read through the text and then we'll go back through it together. The Jerusalem Council has occurred. There has been a decision about the Gentiles. Do they need to become Jews in order to be saved? And the answer is no. Do they need to keep the law of Moses to be saved? No. Do they need to be circumcised to be saved? No. Uh, will being circumcised make you more spiritual? No. Will keeping the law make you more spiritual? No. And in fact, moreover, if a person thinks that they're keeping the law in order to be more spiritual or more uh, readied for the Lord, whether it is part of the front loading of their faith or the back loading of their faith, uh, in fact, uh, Paul says, if you think to be justified by the law, it is no longer added to you as a gain, but it is a debt. Uh, you're distracting from the grace of God. And in fact, this is the word the term fallen from grace comes from. It has to do with a person that thinks that their works is going to justify them before the Lord. The works of the law and the Old Testament and the Old Covenant laws. If you think that by doing those things you're going to be more acceptable to God, you're wrong. And uh, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so does that mean that there is no law, that there is no standard of righteousness, that, that we should live immorally? And of course the answer is no. And so the Jerusalem Council met. They gave instruction to the believers. Uh, they told them to be very cautious about being a stumbling block to the Jews. Those Gentiles were not required to be circumcised. But nonetheless, as we continue our study, get, going right into chapter 16, we find that Paul picks up young Timothy and is going to take him on a missionary journey and circumcises him. And you ask, why? Well, because as was focused in chapter 15, related to those responsibilities of the Gentiles coming to faith, he didn't want this Jewish young man to be a stumbling block to the other Jews. He was raised in a home where his dad was a Gentile, but his mom was a Jew. And therefore, Paul circumcised him so that they could do ministry in the synagogues and not be a stumbling block, not have it be an issue. Just get that out of the way uh, so that we can have a good conversation about Jesus as Messiah. Well, we pick up there in verse five today and work our way through verse 24 and then we'll pick up in verse 25 next Sunday, Lord willing, and work our way through the rest of the chapter. And so beginning in verse five, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mycia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mycia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out, to, uh, went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, Come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now, <clears throat> it happened <clears throat> as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us, 
and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege that we have of studying the Bible. As we study, we know that your word will not return void, but we do ask, on our behalf, we ask that you would open our eyes and open our ears and Soften our hearts that we might hear the word of God and believe. Have our lives changed and be ready then as well to give an answer to everyone that asks of us for the hope that lies within us with meekness and with godly fear. Today, Lord, as we study, we want to be equipped. We want to hear from you. We want you to shape and mold and direct our lives. And so this is our prayer today. In addition, Lord, we pray for the many that are out sick today with this virus that seems to have affected so many, many on the staff here, as you know, Lord, you know all very well that are sick. We pray for each of the staff members that have been affected by this, and even Chris here today, but still getting over this terrible virus. We ask, Lord, that you would bring healing, that you would bring protection. Uh, I suspect that there are many people home today because of this virus that seems to have taken such a hold in our little community here in Coeur d'Alene. We ask, Lord, that you would not only protect those that have not become sick, but also, Lord, that you would give health and strength uh, and recovery to those that have been affected by this virus and allow, Lord, for your name to be glorified in the process. Use these things, Lord, for your purposes. Pray for the children's department today and for those that are working with the kids as well as those young people that are in those classes. Give them health as well and allow them to grow as a result of the Bible study that they enjoy. Pray for the Hispanic Fellowship in this service and our youth groups that meet this service as well. Ask, Lord, that you would use the time there for your glory. And then for those that are watching online, that you would minister to them today, wherever they are, whoever they are, Uh, Lord, be blessed to use this time and these services uh, for the edification of your people and the glorification of your name in the world today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, picking up the disciples and apostles on this second missionary journey, having had a five-year window uh, with the activities of the Jerusalem Council and the trouble that's been taking place uh, with the Judaizers, uh, they begin a journey. Uh, The map here is the second missionary journey. Paul would have liked to have gone back and visit the churches where they'd been serving before, which would have been uh, in a direct Uh, western pathway along the coastline and into Asia Minor. Uh, They did not go into Asia Minor, but rather they were directed by the Spirit of the Lord to go up into Europe. Uh, As you can see the pathway there, and finally they'll uh, end up back in Caesarea and then finally into Antioch, Syria again. And so that 
graphic is just to give you a general idea of this part of the uh, east and then toward Europe, the Asia Minor being bypassed at this point uh, by the directive of the Lord, which we learn about as we read this text. So when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, that would be the very southern region, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia or Asia Minor. Uh, you're familiar with the seven churches of Asia or Asia Minor uh, listed in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, also, as is note, uh, in the later parts of Acts and then in the epistles. You've got Philippi, which we'll be talking about today, Thessalonica, Berea, uh, Laodicea, and so forth. Uh, a lot of activity there. Ultimately, Ephesus, which will become another headquarter. Uh, if you will, uh, for the growing uh, church in the first century. But it's interesting to me that the Holy Spirit forbids them to preach the word in Asia. And then even then, we see in verse 7, after they had gone to Mycenae, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Now, if you're reading a modern translation that's developed out of the Nestle United text, uh, it is going to say the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. That is not in the Texas Receptus, but it's irrelevant uh, in this context, but just pointing that out if you're stumbled over that in your uh, manuscript uh, variation into English. And so the Lord had said, no, you're not going there. Now, I find that interesting. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had experiences in my life uh, that I felt like, man, this is a good idea, we should do this, and the Lord said no. Uh, I'll admit to you that uh, when I first came here to uh, Coeur d'Alene, I came here to help plant a church. Uh, it's still going strong. It's North Country Chapel over in Post Falls. Uh, it was at Koinonia House, for those of you that are familiar with Chuck Missler's ministry in Koinonia House, but at the time it was Koinonia Fellowship. And uh, my involvement there, uh, along with Ray Duran, who is on our staff here, uh, and Bob Davis, who still pastors over in Post Falls, uh, we were kind of the founding three that uh, worked to develop that ministry out of Quinonia House. Well, in the process of time, uh, Quinonia House and North Country Chapel uh, had a separation, so Bob, uh, instead of it being called Quinonia Fellowship, which was the original intent, uh, named it North Country Chapel. Uh, all through, through, also, th through a variety of circumstances, I moved out of that environment and was shortly thereafter placed on the staff at Koinonia House, and I served with Chuck Missler at Koinonia House for about a year and a half before starting Candlelight. But what many of you don't know is that when I came from the Bay Area of California, to help pioneer the church here, I'd been in the ministry uh, in the Bay Area for about 12 years, and before that, a couple of years in Sacramento. And uh, I had in my mind the plan that I would be coming here to Coeur d'Alene to help start this church, uh, which now is the North Country Chapel, and that five years later, I was going to go to England and plant a church in London. And so that was my plan. But, oh, isn't that something that God didn't allow for that? He made a lot of changes and circumstances that came up that said, no, you're not going. Now, in the process of those years, I have to admit, uh, I was wondering what kind of thing is going on and what's God up to? Now, after the fact, I can look back and say God was at work. What's going on here? I don't know. The Holy Spirit forbid them to go. He did not permit them to go. We have this redundant uh, statement both times in relationship to going into Asia, Asia Minor. Why not? You know, I mean, it seems like a good idea to me that they would go to Asia Minor. I mean, later they're going to get there and there's going to be some neat activity. But the Lord said, no, not now. Now, admittedly, when I came here and I had this plan of going to London uh, and, and plant a church after being here for five years, uh, I thought it was a good idea. In fact, after we had been here for uh, I don't know, maybe four, five, six years, I made a trip to England. 
and I wanted to go and see what's going on over there. And my cousin Jim was pioneering a church over there. He's struggling with the work. And I thought I'd go over and encourage him. And uh, by the time I landed on the ground in Manchester, uh, I got phone calls from Brenda and others that said, you got to come home. And I said, man, I just got here. You know, I mean, this, I, I'm, I'm on a mission. You know, I have stuff. I got things to do. And with out boring you with all the details, I needed to get right back on a plane and come back home. And so the next flight that was available was like 12 hours later. So I, la I lasted all of about 12 hours in England. And I'm like, what in the heck is going on? Well, you might have guessed by now, but I didn't go five years after arriving here to plant a church in England since I'm standing right here. That was 21 years ago when we first came and started Candlelight. That wasn't the original plan. The original plan was to be over in Post Falls with Bob and then to be in London, England. Now I have a plan, and that is to plant a church in Maui. And <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is forbidding me. <laughs> Brenda, Brenda started laughing, and she's like, Really? You know, the, the, when the fall comes and I have to break out the fall colors and I realize, you know, it's going to get cold, I, I start getting tempted. You're going to hear me talk about this over the next five, six, seven. How long does winter last here? <laughs> Nine months. But I'm here. I believe God has called me to be here and to serve the rest of my years here uh, with you. Uh, we have ideas, we have plans, we have things we'd like to see done. Uh, you know, we're planting that church in Longmont, Colorado right now. I, th I think that we might have an idea about doing some other church planting uh, and, and development. But, uh, you know, right now the, the thought is, and I believe this is the case, I feel confirmed in the Lord by uh, His grace, uh, that we're going to be here. And so I'm glad God sent me here. I'm glad that we can be friends. I'm glad I can be your pastor. I'm glad to invest myself. Brenda's glad to invest herself in this community. But why didn't the Lord allow them to go to Asia Minor? It seemed like a good thing, just like a good thing to go to London. Today, less than 2% of the people in, in uh, England are Christian. Less than 2%. That's tr a terrifying number. Uh, in America today, over half of the population still consider themselves Protestant Christian. Uh, that's an amazing number, 50%. Used to be 80. Uh, we're certainly seeing decline. Uh, but uh, when you think about 2%, you might think, well, man, it's a good idea to go there. If you think about going into Asia Minor, you think this is a, a very needy area. Uh, we should be going there. And Paul says, I'm going. And the Holy Spirit says, no, you're not. Why? Well, God has to prepare the hearts. God has purposes and plans. God does things his way in his time. And we need to know that. I remember once I uh, saw some Jehovah's Witnesses come into our door. And I thought, ha ha, this is going to be fun. Because, you know, I'm a theologian and I figure these guys, will they won't know what to do with me, you know. And uh, admittedly, I've had many conversations with Mormon uh, missionaries and Jehovah's Witness missionaries. And, uh, but in this particular case, when they got to the door and I was thinking I was going to have myself a little party with them, uh, I opened the door and it's like the Lord shut my mouth. I'm not kidding you. It was just like the Lord's timing. He, he wasn't, there was no point in me even trying to talk because the Lord just did not give me that opportunity and or uh, put it in my mouth to speak to him. And afterwards, I remember closing the door and thinking, what in the world just happened? I mean, it was so obvious that the Lord just didn't have me share with him. Uh, I don't know how to explain that. Paul didn't know how to explain this. Now, it seems that uh, at one point, uh, at least some theologians suggest that he was sick and therefore couldn't go as a result of his physical infirmity. Uh, remember, he wrote to the Galatians about that. But then going on, I mean, you, you get better and you get, keep moving. The Holy Spirit says no. The Spirit of Jesus, as I mentioned uh, in the Nestle United manuscripts, uh, say the Spirit of Jesus said no. And so passing by Mycenae, verse 8, they came down to Troas. Now, interestingly enough, this is where Luke lives, uh, and uh, they're going to pick him up along the way. 
And so God was at work even when they didn't think he was. God was redirecting even when they thought he wasn't. Uh, in my life, as I mentioned already, I know for certain that God has brought us to this point where we are this very day. And during all this stuff, all the changes and all the redirections, I was thinking, man, where's God? Uh, I, I knew that he was in the mix, but not to the degree that I know now. So you look back over your life and you say, man, I can see what God was doing. I remember um, when I was uh, in Bible school managing a business uh, and wondering what in the world that had to do with ministry. And then I realized that churches are, you know, they have a business element to them. You know, the, this church, we have a $2 million a year budget. And we have responsibilities for those things. Now, obviously, I don't do all that by myself. Uh, we have bookkeepers and we've got uh, board of directors and all. But I, I need to know how to do all that stuff. I need to know how to manage all that stuff. There's so many things that God takes us through to prepare us. And then there are people that God is preparing. And at certain times, those people have not yet been prepared to hear the word of the Lord at the appointed time when they should have reception of the gospel. You know that. Many people you've shared with and they didn't respond and later they do. And you wonder, well, what was going on? I know for me personally, if somebody asked me what is one of the regrets of your life, I'd say that I didn't surrender my life to the Lord earlier. Why did I have to be such a doofus for so many years? Uh, and, and look at the harm I caused uh, in those early years. Why didn't I just know the truth and just be able to accept it and respond and surrender to the Lord early on? I don't know. Uh, maybe you could call it my rebellion, but in the timing of the Lord, I know God orchestrated the day that I really responded to the gospel. Amen? And that's true for you guys as well. Now, in this case, they go to Troas, and there a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Now, I think that's an interesting statement because you say, well, if it was a vision in the middle of the night, then it must have been a dream. And admittedly, I will tell you that this is not the first time it comes up in Scripture. In the, in the book of Daniel, Daniel says, when I was on my bed asleep, I had a vision. Uh, in, the, in the book of Daniel, we read this more than once. Uh, I can attest to the fact that there's a difference between a dream and a vision. There have been times that I was sleeping and I had a vision. Uh, I've mentioned to you guys uh, some time ago, uh, well, years ago, about a dream that I, have about going, I had about going to hell before I was surrendered to the Lord. And boy, I'll tell you what, it was vivid, it was defined, it was, it was instructional. I mean, there was so much about it. It wasn't one of those foggy, you know, I had too much pizza dreams. There, there was a very definitive uh, word from the Lord coming at me. Well, in this case, the same thing. Paul is apparently asleep, but he, he understands the difference between a dream and a vision. He has a vision. And a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with them, saying, come up or come over to Macedonia to help us. And so Paul says, well, I can't go over there and I can't go over there. So why not? Let's go to Macedonia. Maybe this is the Lord. And so he says, um, uh, after seeing the vision immediately, uh, and we have the word we, sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, the we and us is the first time in this uh, storyline, and it is likely that that we is Luke. And so by this point, uh, from Troas, Luke joins the journey. So up to that point, it was they, they, and they, and now we pick up we. And so Luke is going to be traveling with them, and they head out to find, they think, the man of Macedonia who pleaded with them and said, come over to help us. Therefore, sailing from Troas, uh, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. And again, we don't need to look at the map. We've seen it. Uh, if you have maps in the back of your Bible, almost every Bible has Paul's missionary journeys. You can always reference those later. But Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony... Uh, and now, what is that? A colony. Now, this is a Roman colony. Uh, that was uh, occupied by the Romans, oftentimes a, a group of uh, retired uh, Roman officials and, and military men uh, would go there, and all the rules, jurisdiction, the, the mannerisms, etc., 
were all built around the Roman law and customs and cultures. And so in this case, it was a Roman colony, and that's important to uh, recognize. It probably doesn't mean that much to you and me, but it will mean a lot to the storyline as we move forward because the way Paul gets treated in Philippi is against the law of Rome, and Paul was a Roman citizen. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that next Sunday, uh, but it is important to note it was a Roman colony, and there were very few or no Jewish men in that city. But of course, a reception to the gospel is there, which you'll see. And thus you have the letter to the Philippians that comes up later. Uh, they helped and supported Paul in ministry. And so a great work was done. Fruitful things were taking place in Philippi. Well, this is the beginning of that work. And so they land in Philippi, the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. They stayed there actually for quite a while. Now on the Sabbath day, we went out to the city, uh, to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now this is interesting, because Paul's custom... And even the circumcising of Timothy for the missionary journey that I mentioned before and last week, uh, this was so that when they went to the synagogues, it wouldn't be a problem. Well, by the time they are on their way to Asia Minor and God says, no, you're going to Europe, uh, they end up uh, going to Philippi. And when they're in Philippi, their custom would have been to go to the synagogue, but there was no synagogue. That means there was not 10 Jewish men. It was required that you have 10 Jewish men before you could have a synagogue. That also enters that conversation about Jesus' words, wherever two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them, because oftentimes, uh, uh, well, I mention it because oftentimes people uh, think that that means if you get more people, you can gang up on God and God will have to do what you ask. You know, hey, pray with me because, you you know, two or more are gathered in my name, then he'll be there, you know, and, and you think more people, more power. And then, you know, because God's our errand boy after all. And if we can just manipulate him enough, then we'll get what we want. How many of you know that that's not what's going on? Okay. A couple of you. Um, so what's going on? Uh, well, Jesus was actually showing them, look, you don't have to be in the synagogue to pray. You don't have to have a group of 10 men to pray. You don't have to have a, uh, you know, the, the minimum Jewish requirement. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there. I'm, I'm listening to you. You can have a personal, interpersonal relationship with me. Anyway, that's what the, the, the thing was, that Jesus, with those words. But in this case, there wasn't 10 Jewish men. And so they would customarily, usually go buy some running water. Uh, for a, probably a variety of reasons. Uh, but in this case, it was true of the uh, uh, children of Israel when they're in captivity in Babylon. Uh, they went out by the river Chabar, remember, and there they sat. And then you read some Psalms about that. Oh, and they remembered the days in, in Israel and in Jerusalem when they were grieved that they were exiled from their land. Uh, and so they would be out by the river. Uh, just to seek the Lord, pray, talk to the, to the Lord, even, even uh, if, we're, if we're through the scriptures that were available to them at the time, uh, the parts of the Torah and the Psalms and so forth. Uh, it's also interesting to me is that the Jews, even to this day, have a real hard time with the fact that you and I could talk to the Lord uh, as friends. Uh, we can have personal relationship with the Lord. We can talk to him about anything. Uh, we don't have to read our prayers out of a prayer book. If you go to Israel today and you go to the Western Wall, uh, also known as the Wailing Wall, you'll see all the Jews are praying with a book in their hand and they're reading their prayers. And the idea of you having a, just a, a general conversation with God is very foreign to the Jewish mind. Well, uh, these guys go out and uh, they're, they're, they're meeting by a river so that they could just spend some time thinking about and talking with the Lord. They're in a, a Roman city and they are Jewish. Now, in this case, Lydia uh, is the woman that's going to come into view, and she was probably not a full proselyte to Judaism, but uh, meaning that she hadn't gone through the various rituals involved. Uh, in her case, it would have been water baptism or a ceremonial cleansing in a, 
in a mikveh uh, and uh, offering of sacrifice. Uh, but uh, that's probably not the case with her. With her. Uh, there was no man listed, and so there would be no reference to anybody having been uh, a Jew other than these people that are worshipers of God, seekers of God, and hungry for what God was doing. And so in their hunger, in their thirsting, in their readiness, God sends Paul and Silas and Timothy and now Luke, uh, along with other traveling companions, I'm sure, and they end up from Troas, they end up in uh, Philippi, uh, where a, quote, man of Macedonia says, come over and help us. Now, who was that man? I don't know. Was there even a man in Macedonia? I don't know. Uh, we don't have any list of a man coming up in the storyline, but nonetheless, uh, this man of Macedonia says, come and help us, and so Paul says, all right, let's go. So they get there, and they end up uh, by the riverside where prayer was customarily made. Verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. So the man of Macedonia, we don't know, but we do know Lydia, and she's a woman. Now, interestingly and important is that the gospel that goes forth goes forth in the same way to male and female, bond and free. Uh, and so uh, Jew or Gentile, either way, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so in this case, uh, these women are going to be addressed by Paul. Now, again, that would be a little bit out of the custom. Paul would go typically to the men, but there were no men, apparently. And therefore, he says, well, there's a group of women, and they're praying, and therefore, I'm going to go uh, talk to them. And he, got, and he does, and she responds. Now, the identifier here with Lydia is that she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, which is in Asia Minor. Interesting. Now, he's got, he has a plan to go to Asia Minor, but uh, the woman that God has prepared uh, for this ministry is actually from Asia Minor, but she's in Europe. So, wow, what's going on? You know, what, 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 is, what is the Lord after here? And so, uh, he says to her, you know, you can, can hear the words of the Lord, and the Lord opens her heart so that she might hear. But before we go there, we should mention the fact that she's a seller of purple. Uh, which would mean that she was very likely very wealthy. Uh, purple dye came from sea snails, uh, and so th this was not easy to come by. And the Romans, in particular, wanted the royal garments, and therefore there was a, on a big market for purple dye and for purple clothing. And so she was a seller of the product, whether it was just the clothing itself and or the dye itself. And so she was a seller of purple, which was very expensive. And you're going to see in a minute that she has these people come into her house, and it no doubt was a big enough house to house them all, and which tells you again that she was probably very wealthy. And so God is now dealing with a wealthy woman, uh, the first of those named as the, the planters, of, if you will, in the foundation of the church at Philippi. Now it says here that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And I love that expression. In 2 uh, Corinthians 4, uh, we talked about this on Wednesday night. Uh, we were talking about the fact that the God of this world had blinded the eyes of those that did not believe. Now, there was a certain level of blindness that everybody has until they have that illumination of the Spirit. Uh, and then there is the rebellious who reject the Lord, the, the God of this world, the devil, uh, adds to and, and assists in the blindness uh, by br bringing distraction and so forth, uh, lest they should hear the gospel and believe. But in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, we know that the, the Lord opens, we, if you read this to yourself later, uh, the Lord is the one that illuminates the heart and, and gives the person an opportunity to believe the gospel. And so God readies the person. Uh, and then, as you'll see later in the same chapter, Paul prays for those that are in uh, the Ephesian church that the eyes of their understanding might be enlightened. So there is a supernatural Holy Spirit activity that's taking place in people, and it must take place in people in order for them to believe the gospel and be saved. 
And so in this case, it's identified. The Lord opened her heart. I've seen this so many times. I mentioned it a while ago. You, you share the gospel with someone, and it seems like they don't respond right away, and then later on something happens and they do. Um, I had an experience here uh, in the last 10 years or so at Candlelight where a guy, uh, his name was Bianca Larson. Uh, he was very active in Hayden, Hayden City Council, or Hayden uh, 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 Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I remember when they did the Hayden air shows and all that stuff, he was very involved in that. He was not a believer. I don't know if anybody remembers his name, uh, Bianca Larson. Uh, strange guy. Um, and now, I'm going to describe why I thought he was strange. And for you, if you don't think it's strange, that's fine. That's your business. I'll leave it alone. But when he came to see me, he came in and every one of his toenails were painted a different color. Now, that just was a tip off. This is a strange guy for me. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, guys in painted toenails is a little weird. But everyone different color even. And so, and he, you know, he came in and he comes waltzing into the office to see me. What do you want to see me for, Bianca? Well, I want you to plan my funeral with me. I said, yeah, but you're not dead. And he says, I know, but I, I want you to do my funeral. I says, what in the world? I said, you don't go to church here. You, and, I, and, and I know you. You know, are you, you know, are you a believer? No, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't, I don't trust Christ. For, I, I don't, I'm not into all that religion stuff. Uh, and, but uh, I want you to do my funeral. And I says, well, what in the heck? And he says, I don't know. I've just been watching you over the years. I see what God's doing. Or, I, no, I'm, now I'm putting words into his mouth. Uh, I see what's happening at Candlelight, and I like what's going on over there. I like what you guys are doing. And so when I do die, I want you to do my funeral. So I says, all right, well, we got some forms, and I got a, it sat down with him for an hour, and we took a bunch of notes, and I planned his funeral with him, and I put it in a file and gave it to the secretary. It says, go ahead and... File that away. Someday this guy's going to die, and I guess we'll go pull out the file. Well, a few years go by. I don't hear anything, and all of a sudden I get a phone call, and it's uh, some members of his family. And they said, are you Pastor Paul? And I said, yeah. And they said, um, we've been looking through my dad's records, and he's got this file here that says he wants you to do his funeral, and he's on his deathbed right now. We're wondering if you could come over to the house. I said, well, Okay. So uh, I get uh, in the car and I go over there and I, I remember when I went to the door to knock on the door, I, I remember praying and saying, Lord, this moment could change this guy's destiny. This guy that could end up in hell in an hour could end up in heaven in an hour. And I remember praying, God, please go in there before me. And God put in my heart to read a scripture uh, to him about the servants that worked in the field. And you guys might remember the parable of the, the workers in the field when the guys started early in the morning and they got a denarius. And guys started at noon, well, they got a denarius. Afternoon, denarius. The evening, late, denarius. They, uh, denarius is a day's wages. And so I thought, well, this is a, you know, one of those 11th hour deals. This guy's about to die and I, I would like to see him come. So I'm going to read this to him. So I go in there and he's like in a coma. You know, I mean, he can't talk, he can't communicate or anything. He's in his bed. But when I go into the house, there's all kinds of family members. And of course, you know, you're kind of nervous. You're like, ooh, this, this is a little different. And so I remember saying, well, where is he? And they said, well, he's in the bedroom. I said, well, shall we go in and I'll pray with him? And they said, okay. And so everybody comes in and they're all gathered around the table, uh, the bed. And I sat down on the edge of the bed and helped, grabbed a hold of Bianca's hand and and I said, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if you can respond to me, but I'm going to read to you from the Bible. And I read him the story. And then I said, Bianca, you're the guy that came at the last hour. This is, a, this is 11th hour for you. And you need to respond to the gospel. And you need to trust Christ for your salvation. And I says, I'm going to pray for you. And I began to pray. And I prayed kind of in the first person on his behalf. God, I recognize you. Uh, as the creator. And Jesus, you're the only begotten son of God. You died for my sins. And, uh, and I ask you to be my savior and to forgive me of my sins and let me be in heaven with you. And um, I said, now, Bianca, I, I pray this prayer. If you agree with me, if you want to make that your prayer, squeeze my hand. Now, he hadn't moved. And I remember looking down at my hand and his hand in mine, and every eye in that room was looking at my hand. And you know what? He squeezed my hand. And the place was going crazy. I mean, everybody in there was weeping. 
He hadn't moved. He hadn't squeezed a hand. He hadn't responded to anybody. But that 11th hour, God had prepared his heart. God had opened his heart. Well, why not before? I don't know. What, why, what's God doing? Why does he do that? I don't know, but God is sovereign, and he does what pleases him. And so God opened the heart of Lydia. I pray that God opens hearts today. If you're here today and you've never been in a church, you've never heard the gospel, you've not listened to the truth of the simple gospel, it's not about joining churches and following all kinds of rules. It's about just trusting Jesus as Savior. Forgive me of my sins, Lord. If that's you, today might be the day that God has opened your heart. And if he is, just respond. There's no obligation. He made all the obligations to you. I'm glad he did. Well, she heeded the things spoken by Paul. And so after believing, Paul takes her out so that she can be baptized. Well, she and her household were baptized. She begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. And so she had a big enough house that all these people could go there. And they all, the whole missionary team stayed there, again, pointing to the fact that she was very likely wealthy. And it wasn't her by herself. They didn't go to some house with some woman by themselves. They had a whole bunch of people, and they had a bunch of family members in that house, and they went. But they were baptized after they believed. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is an open testimony, and identifier that says, I believe. I'm trusting the Lord. Well, it happened that... As they went to prayer, and this is a continuation of the storyline, and they'd been there for some time, a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that, or he came out that very hour. Now, this is a weird story. Uh, Now, first of all, what about demons, demon possession? Uh, We don't have a lot of time to dig into all this today, but demons are fallen angels. Uh, it seems as though the demons, uh, these fallen angels, have, have been disallowed at the present time at least to uh, uh, fail in their desire to be manifested in the natural, fleshly. Now, it seems that r- the non-fallen angels can. The Bible says, be careful how you entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unaware. But demons want to inhabit a body. Even the the demons that came out of the man of Gadara were cast into a herd of swine because they wanted to be in a physical body, which tells you that animals can be demon-possessed just like a human. Well, in this case, this is a woman, and she's demon-possessed. An evil spirit lives in her, and this spirit in the Greek is python. Now, this is the way it reads in Greek. We just say it's possessed with a, a divination, spirit of divination. Fortune telling. Well, the word Python there is important because in Delphi and in uh, uh, Apollos, uh, the the Greek gods, goddess, uh, this was the main spirit that was worshipped. And so in the Greek culture, this was a big deal. And for a woman to have the spirit of Python, uh, this false goddess, so to speak, uh, this evil spirit, uh, was a big deal, and these guys had, had, had taken the captive of this woman and used her as a slave so that she could tell through actual demonic activity people's fortunes, divination, speak through the, uh, the d- dimensions of the spirit. And it's interesting. Now, briefly, I can tell you this. M- many people don't realize that demons have been around for 6,000 years. And demons are smart, and they know history, they know geography, they know sociology, they know anthropology, uh, they are g- familiar with the sciences. I mean, when you, you get involved in, with demons, you'll find out real quick how smart they are. But one thing they don't have spiritual illumination concerning, that is Holy Spirit illumination, is about the future. But based on all the things that they do know, 
There are certain things that they know about the future, but based on what they do know, historically, geographically, sociologically, anthropologically, et cetera, uh, they are able to make some fairly good educated guesses about things in the future. And so when people go see a fortune teller, uh, there's a lot of times stuff that you go, ooh, that's kind of creepy, that's real. But the most uh, pronounced deception that we see is when people get involved in reincarnation and start talking about past lives. And they go, well, you know, oh, let me read your poem. Back in a past life, you used to be a princess. Why is it that they were always a princess, not like a turd, you know, or something else? You know, I, I don't know. That was a Freudian, by the way. I meant to say frog. I, I don't know why. Don't laugh. I'm trying to calm down. So, you know that when you're going to cry, you're laughing so hard, you're going to cry. I'm right there on the edge. Whew. I'm out of time. I don't have a minute to laugh. It's a, but they'll say, you know, you were, you were born in this little city in Worcestershire, England, you know, and it was a cobblestone street, and there was a little white picket fence, a blue house, and all this stuff. And, Ooh, wow, I was a princess. And, I, and then they go, and they go on their own pilgrimage, and they go to Worcestershire, and they go, and they find the little street, and, you know, and they go, ooh, look, there's cobblestone street. Oh, look, there's the white picket. It is a blue house. And they believe it. You guys, I'm going to tell you something. Demons can traffic like that. They, they can go over to West Worcestershire and see a little city and a little town and a little, uh, little street and a little village and a little, uh, you know, all that stuff. And they can just tell you about it. And they go, ooh, I must, it must be true. Don't be deceived by that garbage, okay? Now, another thing I want to point out here is this python is a serpent. And I just point out this because today we have this deception of yoga. And yoga is a uh, Eastern religious practice. And it comes out of Hinduism and out of uh, 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 Buddhism. And the kundalini spirit is a serpent. And by the time you get through all your steps and all your hair of the dog and everything else that you're drinking, uh, you end up with the kundalini. And, and this is a demon spirit where you find enlightenment. I'm going to tell you something. That is dangerous stuff. Get out of that. Okay? Go Christian yoga, whatever. That's just like saying Christian witchcraft. Anyway, this girl follows Paul around and the men. And she's saying these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now you would think right away, reading that, well, this must be good. I mean, she's given us free advertising. Now, two things come to mind. Number one, uh, you don't know what her tone was. You don't know what her facial expression was. Was she going around going, these men are the men of the Most High God? Or was she going, ha, these men are the men of the Most High God? I mean, we don't know, see? But here's what we do know, and this is what you don't know. In the Greek versus the English, you might want to see that there is a definite article that is not in the Greek. And it reads like this. The girl followed Paul and us, cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us Cross this word out in your Bible, the way of salvation. The is a definite, and the definite article is not in the Greek. And so it would read correctly, a way of salvation. Now you know why Paul is grieved. These men are teaching you a way of salvation. No, 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 there's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And if you don't know that, in the English translation of your Bible, you're going to be messed up. Why in the world did that cause Paul to say she's demon-possessed? Well, now you know. Not to mention the discerning of spirits and so forth. Now, I'm out of time, so I'm going to rush through the last few verses here. He cast a devil out of her. The devil comes out of her. But the masters saw that their hope of, of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Now that, in particular, would have been that they're saying that Jesus is God. 
when in fact the Romans were commanded by law to say that Caesar is God. Caesar is Lord. In fact, many of the Christians, as you know, in mass, thousands and thousands were killed because they refused to say Caesar is Lord. And so these guys are correctly accusing, based on their law, that they're teaching customs which are not lawful for the Romans to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods, which, if you are a Roman citizen, you're not allowed to be beaten uh, uh, you're not to be scourged. Also, you can't be scourged without a trial. And if you have a trial, you also have a right to appeal. And so it, it, a lot of our customs come out of the Roman uh, worldviews. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more next Sunday. And so they were beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into the prison, commanded the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And so the, the jailer is so concerned, he says, keep them secure. Uh, he puts them in the inner prison, which might have been like a dungeon or a hole in the ground underneath. Uh, oftentimes they would put uh, guys down in a pit where they couldn't get in and out. And uh, sometimes they would be chained to the wall. Uh, we've seen those kind of pits before, uh, especially when we go to Israel. And then also in addition uh, to in the inner prison, uh, put the feet in the stocks. Well, why in the world? What kind of threat are these guys? Well, they said we don't want them to escape. And it is possible by this time the rumors about this group, the people of the way, have gotten around. And remember when Peter was preaching the gospel and the Lord let him out by an angel. Remember when the, Peter and John were preaching and they got beaten and put in prison and they says, well, go get them out of the jail. And the next day they went to get them out of the jail and they said, they're not there. Well, where are they? Well, they're back in the temple square preaching again. You remember all that? And so these guys, woo, these guys are trippy, man. Let's, let's find out how we can keep them in there. So they're going to lock these guys in the inner prison, in the stocks, and then God can't get them out. Well, we'll see how that goes next Sunday. Amen? Amen. Let's, uh, let's stand for a closing uh, word of uh, prayer and song. You guys come and, and uh, let's enjoy this last song. I, I walked out in the first service, uh, as I always do, like to get out into the lobby and uh, greet you guys a little bit, and I just loved it. It was—it's a hymn, and it's just so appropriate and so perfect. Is Chris alive? No, he's—he's he's given it over to me. So. Oh, he has. Okay, well, good. Thank you. He's real sick. Okay, so you're taking over. Good. Thanks. Do you have a a, a cable for your guitar? Uh, yes, I do. All right. Good. Well, you guys will enjoy that. Brenda can help out here with that. Um, but let me just tell you guys something while they're getting ready. When you don't think God's at work in your life, he is. When God shuts a door, it's because he's opening a different one. When you think that God is uh, messing up your life, he's not. Now, we have a tendency to sometimes mess up our own lives, but God is at work in you both to will and to do for his own good pleasure. God wants to do some awesome things with you guys, with me with all of us, and we prepare our way. The Bible says man plans his way, but God directs their path. Aren't you glad to know God's directing your path in spite of you? I am. I'm glad that we're here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I'm, I hope that God allows great things still in our future, but I can tell you one thing for sure. Whatever it is, uh, I have no idea what all the details are. I'm just trusting the Lord as we go for the ride. So we get busy. It's like a boat. Rob's got a little boat. He goes out there in the lake. Bob, Rob, you know that when you're in the lake, uh, that boat ain't going nowhere unless it's moving. If you're, if you're just sitting there and you steer, you know, or maybe you're steering like this if you have a boat, uh, you know that if mo that boat is not in motion, it's not, you're not turning nothing. You can go like this or you can go like this and just sits there. But when you get that boat going, then you can be directed. And so, you know what? Don't sit around saying, well, Let's not go to Bithynia. Let's not go there. Let's just go. Let's just start going. And when God is able then by his grace to start directing our path, we're moving. And he will direct our path. Amen? Man plans his way, but God directs his path. Let us go, therefore, in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys.